At Duke, we have several clusters on campus devoted to something called human development. There is the Center for the Study of Aging and Human Development. And here at SSRI, where we're filming this video series, we have teams devoted to education and human development, including Bass Connections teams on education and human development, and even scholars devoted to education and human development. As an undergraduate, you can even get a certificate in something called human development. But what do we mean when we talk about human development? In this module, we're going to discuss two major historical strands to help us understand how human development has burrowed its way both into academia and into public policy. On the university level, we can think about human development in terms of its evolution as an academic discipline. It's an inquiry into how human beings grow and learn, not just in school, but as social beings. And it's useful because it helps bring together various academic disciplines. It brings together biology and psychology. It brings together anthropology and insights from sociology. It brings together education and biomedicine. And it takes the best of these sorts of things, the things that are complementary in each of these, into this sort of interdisciplinary stew to help us understand how human beings go through their evolutionary process, their life cycle. Now, in all likelihood, Homo sapiens have been thinking about the human life cycle since we've had Homo sapiens. And surely classical scholars could tell us something about how ancient Sumerians or ancient Greeks or ancient Chinese thought about something akin to our notion of human development. But our specific connotations don't really appear until after World War II, with textbooks like this one on human development and education by Robert J. Havinghurst. And it's books like this one that start breaking down the idea of human development into discrete developmental tasks that we accomplish at various ages. The emphasis generally was on the early developmental tasks. And books like this one from 1962 helped break down these tasks into when we could expect that they might take place. These early researchers had just a fraction of our current scientific knowledge about these topics, but they institutionalized the idea that there were appropriate ages to teach kids about numbers and shapes, about languages, and about sex. This probably sounds like common sense to you, but consider that we have often not thought about childhood the way we do now. For instance, today we think that early childhood trauma has a profound effect on who we are as adults that these things that happen even before we have memories can profoundly affect our trajectories. But in Germany in 1200, people didn't think that what happened to you as a child mattered to who you became as an adult. But in 1500, in China, Neo-Confucians thought that children mattered way more than adults mattered, that actually the key to a good life was preserving the heart of the child. In America, the common schools of the 19th century packed children ages 2 through 20 into one classroom, and child labor persisted in this country well into the 20th century. But as medical advances have reduced the number of children who die in early infancy or childhood, and as we've trended towards having fewer children per family, the emotional attachment that we give to each child, much less our study of how children grow and learn, has changed dramatically. But besides human development as an academic inquiry, there's a story to tell about the way that government started caring about the education and well-being of their people. And in many ways, this story begins on the battlefield. The Prussians, for instance, were stung by the defeat at the hands of Napoleon. And in the wake of that defeat, they created the first great state educational system, which became the talk of the rest of Europe and America. Jumping ahead to World War I, Great Britain sought more and more bodies to feed into the maw of trench warfare. But British officials became appalled at the number of physical deficiencies amongst those they were trying to conscript. In short, government started caring about education and welfare because it would improve their physical fighting force, their human resources for war, their manpower, as became the term of art during much of the 20th century. Now, trying to get the most of its fighting force was much of the story, but we should also consider that labor movements are also pushing their governments during this time period to improve education and health care for all of its citizens. By the 1960s, the atomic age upon us, these discussions of manpower became less wrapped up in getting the numbers right for the battlefield 
and more about making sure that we had the scientists and engineers prepared to design the weapons and rockets that we needed to win the Cold War. But by the 1960s, and especially into the 1970s, the imperative of human development moved beyond the military into a way to talk about post-industrial society, as people in the United States and Europe noticed how the economy was changing from one geared around manufacturing to one geared around services. The concept of human development was a way to move beyond purely materialistic concepts of social progress, like per capita income or GDP. And it was a concept that was going global during the 70s and 80s, as international organizations like the UN or the World Bank that had begun their life worrying about infrastructure projects like dams or ports or roads or electricity grids, as they became focused much more on pro-poor agendas, they developed human development indices that measured education and longevity, other markers to help understand whether a society was making progress beyond just purely its wealth. And this talk of human development indices brings us back to academia, where as governments became more concerned about human development, so did social scientists. The last few decades, they've started rummaging through dusty archives in order to produce their own human development indices going back several centuries. A lot of this data is spotty and incomplete, better for academic debates than it is for guiding public policy. But it is indicative of the way that the academy and public policy interact with each other, help shape the questions that we ask, the, the solutions that we provide, and in our coming modules, we will try to impact both sides of that coin, the academic side and the public policy side, to understand how our concepts and policies related to human development have changed over time.